Hi everybody, my name is Joe Sato, and in this second video, we continue to mathematically explore some of the common definitions and terms related to insurance one might see on exam P or other actuarial exams. The goal of this video, too, is to consider the car insurance example from video one, and add each of the three cases of deductible, benefit limit, and premiums to it in such a way that we can see how all the gears turn and sort of the computations along the way. To quickly remind ourselves of the source material, the expository paper by Anderson and Brown, uh, linked here on the slide two, titled Risk and Insurance, is excellent. Let's recall the working example from our first video involving Clive, who just bought a new car insurance policy. Letting X be the loss amount for one policy under these given probabilities, which we have here for the probability distribution for X, written here as F sub capital X, Using the definition of the expected value and standard deviations, we are seeing that the insurance company has an expected payout per policy of $1,225. And we see the issue here is that the deviation, our measure of risk, is quite a bit higher at $6,596. Arriving at where we left off in video one, let's extend the previous example to consider the case where we are insuring 1,000 such insurance policies, which are identically and independently distributed. This lets us use the fact that the expected value is linear, so we multiply that individual loss by 1,000 to get an overall expected loss of 1,225,000. The major result, which we proved from video one, lets us get at the amount of risk via the standard deviation of this group of 1,000 policies. And we note that the risk here is much less in magnitude relative to the expected overall loss. The goal from here is to, of course, see what we can do about getting either that expected overall loss or that standard deviation, which again is our proxy for risk, lower. Starting with the insurance premium, this is defined as the payment required to become eligible for the insurance itself. As an example, if Clive would need to pay $700 every year to be enrolled in the policy, we refer to the $700 as the premium amount. This terminology, of course, applies outside of car insurance as well and to any other insurable situation. Let's consider our working car insurance example with the same loss probability distribution, and we are also still have to cover 1,000 policies under this assumption. But instead, let's explore the idea that if we impose a $700 premium, how might this affect our expected payout and its deviation? It is always recommended that we write down the new payment random variable considering this premium. Letting x be the loss variable, note that no matter what the loss is, the policy is assumed to have paid us the insurance company, of course, $700. That tells us that we subtract the $700 from the loss. And so another way to say this is that we were responsible for paying X dollars, where we are considering payments out as positive. We are also receiving $700, which we consider here as negative. This leads us to Y, our payment variable, as equal to X minus 700. To compute the expectation and standard deviation of Y from here, Let's just compute the PMF of y directly, as we already know the PMF of x. Replacing x by y plus 700 in the previous PMF, we see the probabilities themselves remain the same. However, the dollar amounts simply shift downwards by 700, which reflects our assumption that negative money is coming to us. Simplifying, we see that 95% of the time we now actually stand to make money, since the loss variable doesn't exceed the premium. Of course, the other 5% of the time is still dampened by the premium amount. Setting up the expected payment calculation directly, we weight each of these new payment amounts by the probabilities themselves. This adds to $525 per individual policy, so on the whole we'll stand to pay out money per individual claim despite this high probability of receiving money. Let's grab the second moment along the way while we're here so we can pivot easily into the variance and the standard deviation. Note that I won't put a dollar sign in front of that value as the second moment here would be measured in the strange units of dollars squared. Using the computational form of the variance formula involving the first and second moments, and then taking the square root, we get the standard deviation of y as exactly the same loss variable x, which is $6,596. We could also have cited the fact that lateral shifts in a random variable do not affect the spread of the variable itself, though we will use this exact computational method when we get to the other two cases where we are no longer doing a simple lateral shift. 
now that we know the expectation and standard deviation of a single payment y, can use those summation formulas to compute the expectation and standard deviation of the sum of a thousand independent and identically distributed policies. Recall that this assumption is not a crazy one. As an in insurance, we require that policies are independent of each other in order to really agree to insure things in the first place. We arrive at a total expected payout of $525,000 with a corresponding standard deviation equal to our prior example, uh, which was $208,595. We know that the premium here did really nothing for our standard deviation. However, the expected payout has reduced a fair amount. A natural question from here is, is there something we can do about this pair of variance, seeing as the premium really didn't help us here? The standard approach is to enforce a deductible. The thinking here is that we want to avoid having to pay small magnitude claims. This actually serves another purpose outside of saving us money. It saves our time. We want our insurance agents and claim processors working on claims that are worthwhile to us and to the policyholders. And if they are stuck processing small dents and scratches, for example, on cars, we might not have the time or have to delay processing more serious cases. This leads us to the definition of a deductible. It is the minimum dollar amount of claims until we, as the insurer, will start picking up the bill. For example, if Clive is under a $500 deductible, Clive will have to pay $500 of his own money towards a claim first before we as the insurer step in. This is true no matter what the original claim or group of claims is. Note that the deductible is typically also periodic. So for example, the deductible could reset every year as is common in health insurance. The deductible can be a tricky concept. So let's consider our working example under this case. We are back to insuring a thousand policies that are still independently uh, distributed and whose loss distribution is like Clive. In this case, though, we enforce a $500 deductible every policy. As before, let's start by writing down what our payment variable y is in terms of our loss variable x. By definition, the first $500 of x, note that we start x at $0, have to be covered by the policyholder and not us. So we consider the first $500 as floor down to $0. If the loss exceeds $500, we now have to step in and have to pay out some non-zero amount of money which equals to the loss amount minus the 500 that the policyholder already put towards the claim. We write this here as a piecewise function where the real line is segmented into losses that are below or above this new threshold. Now let's write down the PMF of Y knowing the PMF of X. We know that for X, there was a 90% chance of no loss and a 5% chance of a loss of 500, which both will now be floored to $0. Of course, the no loss case is already there. This gives us a 95% chance of paying $0. We now reduce each of the two higher losses by the deductible amount, though they keep their original probabilities of 4 and 1% respectively. We have now a nice path from here to get at the expected value and standard deviations. Setting up our expected value by its definition, we get an expected payout of $1,135. Grabbing that second moment while we're here, by squaring each payout and weighting it by the same probability as in the previous calculation, we get that as 39,212,500. Putting the moment information together, we compute our variance and then square root so that we get our standard deviation of $6,158. As before, this represents the risk of a single policy, and so using the similar method involving the sum of independent and identically distributed random variables, we arrive at an expected payout of $1,135,000 and its corresponding deviation of $194,742. We will summarize our results at the end of the video, but we can already tell that our variance here was successfully lowered relative to at least the last example. As our last insurance term, we end on the idea of a benefit limit. This is a way to control how large of a payout the insurance company will have to make on any single claim. There are also other ideas that control this as well in practice, such as the idea of reinsurance, though this is not explored in exam P. Aptly named, the benefit limit is the highest dollar amount the company will pay out for any single claim. For a quick example, let's say under Clive's policy, the company stipulates that they'll only pay out a maximum of $40,500 for any one claim. Really in practice, that means if Clive needs to claim that his entire car was totaled, the most he can get is $40,500. And so that really caps the new car that he is able to purchase. Moving over to our working example involving insuring those 1,000 people, 
which are still independently and identically distributed as Clive was. Let's examine how our payout would be helped under this benefit limit. Much in the same way as a deductible, any claim loss exceeding this limit will get floored down to the limit amount itself. We arrive at a definition of our payment variable y as simply equal to x, except in the case that x is bigger than our cap limit, in which case it just is now equal to a flat amount of 40500 As before, let's compute the PMF of y knowing what the PMF of x is. Since there is only one possibility of loss in x, which goes over our benefit limit, we floor that loss amount down to the $40,500. This gives us the PMF of y as very similar to x, except for that last 1% chance of loss there at the end. Setting up our expectation for y, we arrive at an amount of $1,030. Let's grab that second moment, use those two moments in the computational variance formula, and just one square root later, we arrive at a variance of $4,935 for this single policy. Notice that this is decently below the original variance of x, and really all we had to do was deal with those high dollar claims. This is very true to practice and makes benefit limits particularly useful for dealing with risk. Extrapolating to our group of 1,000 policies, we get an expected payout of $1,030,000 with a standard deviation of $156,058. Let's summarize the three examples that we have seen here and how they did in terms of actually reducing total expected payout and its accompanying standard deviation. Letting S be our sum of those 1,000 independent and identically distributed payout variables. Between this video and video one, we have explored the following four scenarios. In video one, we explored the default scenario in which we simply insure 1,000 people with no other tactics involved, such as premiums, deductibles, or benefit limits. Under the assumptions of the chance of each loss, we have a baseline total expected payout of 1,225,000 and its deviation of $208,595. These are the values to beat, so let's actually consider how our three tactics did. If we impose a $700 premium for each policy, we saw that this dramatically cuts down the expected payout to $525,000. However, the standard deviation was unaffected. This indicates that premiums do a good job of generating capital for the insurance company. However, it does not guard against potential large swings in payouts. Under the $500 deductible policy, we see both expected payout and its deviation are both lowered. However, we are missing that capital generating power of a premium. This seems also true of our last scenario in the $40,500 benefit limit per policy case. Although there we had better control over those high dollar claims, so this performs slightly better. Of course, in practice, we see that all three of these tactics generally get combined to get the improvement each one has to offer all at once. Thank you for exploring these interesting concepts with me and best of luck in your studies.